Let's say that we have a string, for instance, a guitar string. The string is of length capital L, it is stretched along the x-axis and fixed at its ends at points x equals 0 and x equals L. Now we plug the string, that is, we displace it from equilibrium. The displacement of every point on the string is perpendicular to the x-axis. The magnitude of this displacement, which we will denote u, depends on the coordinate of the point on the string, x, and since the string oscillates, it also depends on the time, t. The motion of the string is described by the classical wave equation. It is a partial differential equation, that is, an equation for a function of more than one variable. For our case, that function is the deflection of the string, u, which depends on two variables, x and t. The parameter v is the velocity of a wave moving along the string. Since the string is fixed at both ends, at points x equals 0 and x equals l, the displacements at those points are 0 at all times. Thus, our string is subject to the following boundary conditions. We said that the wave equation is a partial differential equation. It can be solved by a technique known as separation of variables. In this technique, we represent our function of two variables, u of x and t, in the form of a product of two functions, capital X and capital T. Capital X is only a function of the variable x, and capital T is only a function of the variable t. Writing u as a product of two functions, capital X and capital T, that each depend on only one variable, is referred to as factorizing u of x and t, and the product representation of u is called its factorization. Now we will introduce the factorization of u into the wave equation. On the left-hand side, we have the second derivative of u with respect to x. Since capital T does not depend on x, it can be taken outside the differentiation operator, and we get the product of capital T and the second derivative of capital X with respect to X. Similarly, on the right-hand side, we have the second derivative of U with respect to T. Since capital X does not depend on T, it can be taken outside the differentiation operator, and we get the product of capital X and the second derivative of capital T with respect to T. The prefactor 1 over v squared remains unchanged. In the next step, we divide the left and the right hand side of the wave equation by our function u of x and t in its factorized form. When we do this, we get an equation where the left hand side only depends on x and the right hand side only depends on t. Because x and t are independent variables, the equality that we obtained can only hold if the left-hand side and the right-hand side are both constant. This can be seen as follows. Let's say that we fix the value of the variable t, for instance, at t equals 0. Then the function capital T and its second derivative both have well-defined values. At t equals 0, the right-hand side is thus just a constant. We now vary the value of the variable x. Since the right-hand side is a constant, and the equation must hold for all values of x, the left-hand side must also be a constant. While both capital X of x and its second derivative may vary with x, their ratio does not change. We now know that the left-hand side of the equation is equal to the value of the right-hand side when t is fixed at 0. Since the left-hand side does not depend on t, it will take the same value regardless of how we vary t. Thus, if we want the equality to hold for all t, the right-hand side for all t values should be equal to the right-hand side at t equals 0. In other words, it should be a constant that is independent of t. Since the left-hand side of the equation and the right-hand side of the equation are both constant and are equal to each other, they must be equal to the same constant. We will denote this constant capital K. Equating the left-hand side to capital K 
and equating the right-hand side to capital K gives us two separate equations, one for capital X of X and one for capital T of T. Thus, we achieved the separation of variables X and T that we were striving for. Bringing all terms in each of these two equations that we obtained to the left-hand side and multiplying the equation for x by capital X of x and the equation for t by capital T of t allows us to write these equations as follows. The equations that we obtained are second-order ordinary differential equations. That is, equations for functions that only depend on a single variable. Both of these equations have the same form. Here we have denoted the functions that we want to find as f of x and the prefactor in the second term as kappa. We guess that the solution of our equation for f of x has the form exponential of ax, where a is some number. Plugging this possible solution into our equation gives the following result. Since an exponential is never equal to zero, we can divide the left and the right-hand side by exponential of ax. And then we are left with just a squared minus kappa equal to zero, or a equal to plus minus square root of kappa. In effect, we found two solutions for f of x, both of them of the form exponential of ax, but for one, a is plus square root of kappa, and for the other, it is minus square root of kappa. These solutions are called independent because one cannot be expressed as the other multiplied by a constant. It is easy to show that if we have two solutions to a differential equation, then their linear combination is also a solution to that same differential equation. Moreover, the theory of differential equations tells us that any solution of a second-order differential equation can be written as a linear combination of two of its independent solutions. Thus, the general solution of the equation for f of x can be written in the following form, where c1 and c2 are arbitrary constant coefficients that can, in general, be complex numbers. Let us now take a closer look at the boundary conditions for a string fixed at both ends. They are, that is, the deflection of the ends of the string, located at x equals 0 and x equals l, is 0 at all times, since the ends of the string are fixed. Since we factorized our function u of x and t, these conditions could in principle hold because either capital X is 0 or capital T is 0. However, these conditions must hold at all times. So, if the boundary conditions were satisfied because of capital T of t being 0, that function would have to be equal to 0 at all times. Then u of x and t would also be 0 at all times, and not just for the ends of the string x equals 0 and x equals l, but everywhere. This means that the string would be standing still in its equilibrium position. There would be no vibrations. Since that is not the case that we are interested in, we can assume that capital T of t is not identically equal to zero, thus the boundary conditions for u of x and t must be satisfied because capital X of x is equal to zero for x equals zero and x equals l. The general solution for capital X of x is of the following form. At x equals zero, both exponentials are equal to 1, so the boundary condition reduces to c1 plus c2 equals 0 or c1 equals minus c2. Taking into account that c2 is equal to minus c1, we can rewrite the boundary condition at x equals l as follows. This condition could be satisfied if c1 was 0, but in that case, capital X of x and thus u of x and t would be identically equal to zero, which is not what we want. Thus, the expression in the square brackets must be zero in order for the boundary condition to be satisfied. This condition would hold if L were equal to zero, but we are not interested in studying a string of zero length. It would also hold for capital K equal to zero, but in that case, we would again get capital X of x and u of x and t that are identically zero. It is evident that if capital K is positive, 
the condition that the expression in the square brackets is zero can never be satisfied. So we only have one possibility left, and that is that capital K is negative. Right now, we will again revert to looking at the general form of our differential equation, and we'll denote the function that we are looking to find f of x, and the prefactor in the second term, kappa. We know the general solution of this equation. However, if kappa is assumed to be negative, then the square root of kappa is an imaginary number. This means that both exponentials in the general solution can be expanded using Euler's formula. We then can rewrite the expression for the general solution as follows. Or, grouping the terms that contain cosine and the terms that contain sine separately, since C1 and C2 in the general solution are just arbitrary complex constants that only take on fixed values once the boundary conditions are applied, we can replace the prefactors before the cosine and the sine by different complex constants, C3 and C4. We will now see that for certain negative values of capital K, the boundary condition for capital X of X can be satisfied. When X equals 0, the sine takes on the value of 0, but the cosine takes on the value of 1. Thus, for the boundary condition at x equals 0 to be satisfied, c3 must be 0. Then the boundary condition at x equals l becomes simply... In order for it to be satisfied, the expression inside the sine function should take on values that make the sine function 0. The sine function is 0 when its argument is equal to n pi, where n is any integer. Thus, Replacing the square root of minus capital K by n pi over L, we find the form of the solution for capital X of X that satisfies the boundary conditions. Note that there is an infinite number of such solutions, since n can take on an infinite number of values. We will denote the solution corresponding to a given value of n as capital X subscript n of X and the coefficient in front of the sign for the solution as C subscript n. We now turn to solving the equation for time. As mentioned earlier, the equation for capital T of t has the same basic form as the equation for capital X of x. The only difference is that the prefactor in the second term that we denoted kappa in the general equation for f of x is now equal to capital K times V squared instead of just capital K. For reasons of convention, in the equation for time we will denote this prefactor omega instead of kappa. The general solution for capital T of T is then. It can be shown that the right-hand side can be alternatively written as b times cosine of omega t plus phi. Here, b and phi are new arbitrary constants, b is called the amplitude and phi is the phase. Of course, since omega is by definition equal to capital K times v squared, and k depends on n, the value of omega also depends on n. Thus, there are an infinite number of solutions for capital T of t, corresponding to different values of n. We will not write out these solutions more explicitly, since we will be primarily interested in the spatial part of the solution for u of x and t. So we are almost done. We have found the solutions for capital X of x and for capital T of t. All that is left to do now is to write out the solution for the deflection of the string from equilibrium, u of x and t, as the product of these two single variable functions. The solutions that we get for u of x and t are called normal modes, and they have the following form. Here we have replaced the product of arbitrary coefficients b subscript n and c subscript n by a single arbitrary coefficient a subscript n. The most general solution for u of x and t is written as an infinite sum of normal modes. We will not delve deeper into this, but it isn't too hard to show that the general solution for u of x and t is a running wave that can move along the string. However, we will soon see that the normal modes themselves are standing waves. 
Since in the quantum mechanical problems that we are going to be solving, our interest will be almost exclusively in standing waves, let us examine the normal modes a little more closely. We see that the spatial part, the part that depends on x, is given by sine of n pi x over L. This function has a constant value for any fixed x and is independent of time. It is multiplied by cosine of omega subscript nt plus phi. This is a function that is periodic with time. Since cosine takes on values between minus 1 and plus 1, the value of u subscript n of x and t at a fixed coordinate x oscillates with an amplitude a subscript n times the sine. The spatial term in an expression for a standing wave thus defines the amplitude at every given point in space, while the temporal term defines the oscillation frequency. Let's now have a look at the profile of a standing wave, that is, the oscillation amplitude defined by the spatial component of u of x and t. We see that each normal mode contains an integer number of half wavelengths of sine. This is easy to understand. The profile of a normal mode is given by a periodic function, the sine, and we imposed boundary conditions that require this function to become zero at the ends of the string, x0 and xl. Thus, we see that, for the first normal mode, the mode corresponding to n equals 1, the wavelength is 2l. For the second normal mode, it is l. For the third, it is 2 thirds l. For the fourth, l over 2, and so on. We also see that for all normal modes except the first, there are points where the profile of the normal mode passes through zero. Such points are called nodes. Note that simply becoming zero is not enough. The profile must pass through it, that is, the sine function must change its sign. For those of you who know a little bit about music, it might be interesting to know that the frequency of the first normal mode of a string on a guitar or a violin corresponds to the main tone of that string, while the frequencies of modes with higher n correspond to what is known as overtones. Since the wavelength and hence the frequency of an oscillating string depend on its length, it is also clear why shortening a string on a musical instrument by pressing it down with a finger changes the tone of the sound. Thank you for watching, and hopefully you now understand how to solve the wave equation.